Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Baptist Church of Westchester. I'm Pastor Zach, and I do want to say I'm so thankful for our guest preacher last week, Mr. Dwayne Walton of the Parksburg Point. We loved having Dwayne with us, and we hope to see more of him. We'll continue to pray for him as well as his ministry. Looking ahead, I, I do want to remind you that on Wednesday, January 27th at 7 o'clock p.m., we'll have our annual meeting via Zoom, so you want to make sure that you plan to attend. We'll also be kicking off our Super Bowl of Caring to benefit the Westchester Food Cupboard, and we'll be working with another local congregation this year. We'll have more information about that later this week, but you can start to think about that. Stay tuned for, for more information. And lastly, while you have your calendars out, uh, you'll notice that tomorrow is Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And so this weekend and all into Monday, we're reminded of the legacy of the great theologian and Baptist pastor whose dream has not yet been fully realized. I truly believe it's our responsibility as Christians to continue the work that Reverend Dr. King modeled, to pursue racial justice as an integral part of our faith. And though progress has been made in our country, we are still far from done the work of racial reconciliation. Understanding our history is key to understanding our present and can even serve as a light for our future. And to seek that light and engage this work, you have an opportunity coming up with BCWC's Micah 6-8 Book Club. We're going to read the book, A History of the Black Baptist Church, by Reverend Dr. Wayne Croft of St. Paul's Baptist Church right here in Westchester. Reverend Dr. Croft will be joining us on Wednesday, February 24th. So if you're interested in joining, you can talk to Barb Myers. And then you can get ready to explore the history of Black Baptists in the United States. A history that is marked by challenge and resilience, of suffering and solidarity, of fighting injustice through prophetic resistance. These things are indeed biblical. And so with that in mind, we turn to our scripture passage for today. As Baptists, we ought to always begin with scripture for instruction on how to live faithfully. And at the same time, we must always understand the context of the scripture that we're reading. For example, today we're reading Psalm 139, entitled, The Inescapable God. This psalm is often attributed to King David, along with many other psalms. And Fred Geiser, professor of Old Testament, describes the book of Psalms as containing prayers and hymns and meditations of Israel. The psalms have served believers in every generation as a biblical source of prayer and praise, which thus serve as models for us in our response to God. The psalms are first and foremost poetry, and so we read them as such. Another Old Testament scholar, James Luther Mays, calls this particular psalm, the 139th psalm, the most personal expression in the scripture of the Old Testament. It speaks to God's knowledge and God's power and God's presence. And it reflects the understanding that humanity is enclosed and encased in divine reality. It's not always easy to see our human experience enclosed in divine reality. In fact, I tend to see humans making a lot of messes all on their own, which feels like a very human reality. We divide and we divide and we divide some more. This is the history of the church universal and perhaps the history of humanity itself. But as Duane reminded us last week, in Christ, despite our many differences, we are all one in Christ Jesus. And so today, on this Christian Unity Sunday, American Baptists celebrate that we are all one in Christ Jesus. You can see that in the ways that we're feeding the hungry with our Super Bowl of Caring in partnership with another congregation. All of us are made in the image of God. And so we're called to aspire to that unity and to show that we are all Christians through the way we love one another. But love is a difficult endeavor, and Jesus didn't make it easier, especially when he said, 
You have heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For God makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good. God sends the rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. So, if we're supposed to love our enemies, does that mean we're supposed to have enemies? It's clear from our scripture reading last week that when we do love others the way that God loves us, the way that the father loved the son who had seemed to do everything wrong, had squandered his inheritance and came back, when we love like that, we'll often find ourselves at odds with people who are stunned by this kind of radical compassion. The brother, the other brother, who had done everything right by the standards of the day, stood in opposition to his father when his father chose unmerited grace instead of condemnation. And in our psalm that we'll be reading today, we'll hear a prayer to God from somebody else who thinks that they are quite righteous. And this prayer asks for help against his enemies. With all that said, it does seem to me that Christians shouldn't go out and find enemies. That doesn't seem right. But it's also clear that adversaries will pop up when we take our faith seriously enough and when we do things like Reverend Dr. King did. Things like seek justice for the oppressed and speak truth to power. Though not always in the romanticized ways that we like to celebrate. Now, you might have heard this psalm before. It's a beautiful psalm, and at least parts of it will be familiar, especially in the beginning. The first part of the psalm shows how God knows everything about us and how when we're willing to share all of us with God, beautiful things can happen. Here's how it begins. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before me and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. And the fact that God knows us, every single part of us, the parts we post on social media and the parts we hope that nobody ever finds out, this is amazing and alarming. God knows us, the good and the bad, and loves us all the same. And to wrap our minds on around that, to really understand that is nearly impossible. But God isn't just all-knowing. God is also inescapable. The psalmist attests to the power of God's presence when he goes on to say, Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. As hard as we might try, we can never escape God's presence. You might remember a, a year or so ago, I, I read a, a book to the children as part of our children's messages. And this is a book I got as a, a gift from a, a seminary professor when our son Jeremiah was born. The book is called The Runaway Bunny, and she says it's the best book on theology that she owns. In the book, a little bunny has made up his mind and says to his mother that he's going to run away. And to do that, he'll do all kinds of things. First, he'll become a fish, or then maybe a rock on the mountain, a crocus in a hidden garden, a bird, a sailboat, a circus acrobat, and finally, a little boy. 
The mother bunny correspondingly decides to become whatever will make sure that she's near him. First as a fisher, and then a mountain climber, a gardener, a tree, a cloud, a trapeze walker, and finally a mother herself. Wherever the little bunny goes, the mother and her love are there. He finally just decides, okay, I'll be your little bunny, what he was always meant to be. That's a modern day psalm. God is with us no matter what. No matter how far away you feel from God right now, God is with you. And we've learned that God doesn't live right here in the church, right? For the past 10 months, we have worshipped God in places near and far. And you might have known that God's presence is with you from other experiences too. Maybe the first time that you look out at the ocean and take a deep breath and let out the first long exhale that you've had in a long time. Maybe when you see someone that you really love laughing, really laughing, belly laughing, and you get lost in that moment. Or maybe when you see people in need and the community just wraps around them and takes care of them. In all of those moments, we can feel God's presence even when we can't name it. God is everywhere. Hard as we try to pin God down or put God in a box or say with certainty that God is on our side, God is elusive and yet inescapable. Even within our very selves, we see the handiwork of God. The psalmist says, For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me, when none of them as yet existed. In this portion of the passage, we, we hear that phrase that might be the most familiar of all within the psalm. Fearfully and wonderfully made. You are fearfully and wonderfully made by the author of love. If that's not something you've thought about in a while, it might be good to think about it. You, beloved, are fearfully and wonderfully made. To soak that divine reality in fully, again, for the psalmist, is, is just too much. And so he declares, how weighty to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. I try to count them. They are more than the sand. I come to the end. I am still with you. It really is a beautiful and, and poetic prayer. But then... The psalmist does not come to the end, and things take an interesting turn. Then the psalmist turns his attention to his own enemies, enemies he believes are also enemies of God. Interestingly enough, this part is not often read within the lectionary readings. You can imagine it's conveniently left out. And in just a moment, you'll know why. Here's what it says next. Oh, that you would kill the wicked, O oh God that the bloodthirsty would depart from me, those who speak of you maliciously and lift themselves up against you for evil. Do I not hate those who hate you, O God? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with a perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. After 18 verses of this beautiful poetry, singing the, the praises of a God who knows our hearts, the psalmist suddenly demands the death of his enemies, those whose character have been proven harmful to society. I am fearfully and wonderfully made, unlike my enemies who deserve death. Now, to be fair, this is the Old Testament, and we don't yet have the guidance and clarification that is with us through Christ. So that's important information. And we do have the benefit then of interpreting all of Scripture through the lens of the Gospels, 
which means we know that Jesus tells us to love our enemies and not ask for their execution. But before we jump to that, what does this passage infer that our enemies are like? Apparently, the psalmist believes his enemies are those who speak ill of God, those who lift themselves above God, those who hate God. You know, those people. In an article for Faith and Leadership, Kelly Ryan asked the question, how do we reconcile with those people? And appropriately, on this Christian Unity Sunday, she was asking, how do we reconcile the fact that many of the people who stormed the Capitol, many who held up signs with the name of Jesus as they committed violence, in some instances, murder, how do we reconcile with those who have done so in Jesus' name? They certainly weren't the first to commit violence while professing our Lord's name. History is marked with this, of people who've done awful things in the name of God. Do we feel united with them on Christian Unity Sunday? Should we? Some scriptures seem to suggest that we have a responsibility to hold brothers and sisters in Christ accountable when they misuse the name of God and not to stand idly by as the name of Jesus is used inappropriately. In fact, perhaps we should be united against such misuses of our Lord's name. Those were people who claimed Christ's name and somehow claimed to love God. In that same article, Kelly Ryan goes on to say, the Gospels are clear that we are to love our neighbors, to love everybody, no exceptions. But I would argue that addressing our enemies may require some multitasking. Namely, what the most reverend Michael Curry, the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, calls learning to stand and kneel at the same time. Curry is a pastor and theological mind who writes extensively about racial justice and faith. In his book, Love is the Way, Holding on to Hope in Troubling Times, Curry described that when faced with anger and contempt, he learned to stand up for what he believed in was right, while also kneeling and remaining humble and prayerful about the way we engage with others. When we're busy wagging our fingers at each other, we can't move away from the nightmare and closer to the dream, he writes. And sometimes when there's chaos outside, chaos all around us externally, that's a sign that there's some chaos going on inside. What exists outside is sometimes a reflection of what's happening inside. So if we're sickened by the divisions that exist within our communities, and we have very little control of those situations, what we can control is the spiritual work of beginning with what's on the inside, of assessing our own hearts. Because our Christian love that must animate healing and unity in our families and in our country, according to Curry, is the love that is not a sentimental feeling, but a commitment to seeking the good and well-being of others so that we can disagree on bedrock issues, bedrock convictions, and yet stay in a relationship. This kind of love doesn't have preconditions, that's true, but it does have requirements. Those requirements, according to Ryan, include truth-telling and lament and confession alongside a commitment to honor that we are all made in the image of God. We cannot bypass those things in pursuit of indifference, cloaked in language of unity. We have to be honest about what's happening inside and outside. We have to lament and confess our part and that's right, all that stuff that felt so good, being fearfully and wonderfully made, so are our enemies, fearfully and wonderfully made by the author of love. And with that in mind, the psalmist does take a turn in the final verses. Something happened that feels a lot like what happens during the season of Lent, which we're entering a bit early this year. The psalmist looks at all of the wickedness around him. 
the wickedness that he assumes is upsetting to God, but then turns inward. The psalmist comes down from the mountain of fury and remembers that when he points a finger at others, he has at least three pointing back at him. And so he humbly cries, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. How easy it would be to get stuck on that mountain of rage and never make that turn. Skip the part where we ask God to prove us wrong. Skip the part where we search our hearts. Don't get me wrong. There are those people, those who oppose God and those who claim God's name and yet do not commit to the messy work that is love. There are those who put themselves above God and those who rise up against God's prophetic justice and mercy. And we must renounce evil. Many Christians in baptism take an oath to renounce evil in all of its forms. Reverend Dr. King calls the triple evils that we face the evils of racism and economic exploitation and militarism. Christians ought to unite against such evils. This requires truth-telling and lament and confession. And at the same time, we must remember that all are fearfully and wonderfully made. And this points us to a reality that is unsettling at times. We cannot allow room in our hearts for hatred. There is no such thing as perfect hatred for Christians, not the perfect hatred that the psalmist claimed to have. Instead, we must share the psalmist's earnest desire to work against those forces of evil, even when they're hard to detangle from the neighbors that we have. And we must also ask God to show us wickedness in our own hearts. We must pray the prayer that the psalmist prayed. Lord, lead me and humble me and prove me wrong when I am so. This will take multitasking, standing and kneeling. Search us, O oh God. Know us. Lead us to the way everlasting. Amen.